How do you recollect the memories of your Edakal visit in 1974? 74. With the uh, renowned archaeologist H.D. Sankalia. Sankalia. Sankalia, you know, <coughs> before Sankalia, there was no work uh, in the field of uh, prehistoric archaeology in India because the um, archaeological survey of India. They started from early history only, not prehistory. Prehistory was neglected completely. It was Sankalia mm. who started prehistory, and uh, at that time, Sankalia was given a grant by the UGC. During that year, he could go to, he could choose any of the three universities in India and work in each for about a month. They will pay all the uh, uh, expenses and they will also give uh, salary for a secretary and things like that, you know. At that time it was published in the newspapers. So when I, that was the time also, 74, you know. Uh, it was in 1970 that the Kerala University had established um, um, PG centers and started uh, working for a Calicut University for establishing Calicut University and uh, T.K. Ravindran and myself was, were there as lecturers. <laughs> so I wrote and then uh, 1970, T.K. Dr. T.K. Ravindran uh, went to Trivandrum when the history department was established in Kerala University in Trivandrum. So I, I was in charge of the history department here. At that time, mm -hmm. in 1974, when this news came, about Sankalia's uh, grant. I wrote to him. I didn't know him before, but I just wrote to him saying that we have a new department here. Um, it is, it is in, in, uh, we are informed that uh, you can work in one of the three universities for one month or so. So kindly select one, one center as our center, our department. He agreed. Uh, he wrote me, wrote back saying that I am glad that you have invited me. I have a, a desire to visit Edekel because Edekel, Fawcett had written about it in the, in what is that, Indian antiquary. He had seen that, but uh, he had no way of going there. Somebody has to help him to locate the place and they go there, give guidance and help. So he said, uh, I will come to your department and uh, lecture there. Uh, in return, I would expect you to take me to Edekel. I wrote back saying that we will do it. Our students also would like to visit Edekel. Actually, Edekel is not a cave um, and it is not geographically part of Kerala because Kerala is lowlands and Edekel is high on the height. Uh, it is geographically part of the Deccan tableland. You have to come down. Uh, through Tamaris area or any other pass and then reach the plains of Kerala. Yeah. Uh, so, he, when he said this, we, uh, we got ready, our students also. Um, luckily for us, there was a government college there, Mohan Babu, Mohan Babu. He was the principal and he, professor of history there. So, he offered to help us and myself, our students and teachers, we went there to that college, we stayed there in that college with Sankalia. Sankalia was a very thin person, you know, very old, mm. but still very agile, very active also. I was very fat, I could not climb up, you know, mm. but he could do it like a squirrel, eh? mm. although he was very old at that time. So we went there with him, explored the, and we discovered the fact that after Fawcett, nobody had gone there. Fawcett's yeah. writing is there, but nobody had actually visited the place and written about it. And what um, Kesari Valerishna Pillai had written was just uh, a translation, a free translation of what uh, what was there in the Fawcett's article. article. Then we spent a day in the college. At that time, I still remember, there were about 74 or 75 megalithic graves uh, in the valley. But today, only 5 or 6 remain there. These rest have been destroyed. And then in the whole place was uh, 
jungly, it is very difficult, there were snakes there, uh, no steps to go up. So, after that I wrote uh, to the government of India requesting them to make some arrangement for people to go and visit the place and, uh, they, uh, and uh, declare it as a protected monument. So for a long time there was nobody there to look after it. Then we appointed there was a committee, there was one Varghese who was the owner of a tea shop just below that place. He took interest in it and uh, we formed a committee with our um, teachers and students of the Calicut University History Department and Varghese and his people, their local people. Uh, and uh, we appointed a person uh, to be in charge of this, you know, so that others do not uh, destroy the place. Otherwise, quarries were being organized in that place. Then we requested the Kerala government to prevent the quarries from there. Unfortunately, um, Karnagaran was the chief minister and the quarry agent was actually one Ramachandran master yeah. who was his own man, Congress, Congress, yeah. Congress leader. So, we had no um, way out. I went to the prime minister's office in Delhi and spoke to the Prime Minister's secretary and requested him. He obliged us uh, by uh, contacting the Chief Secretary of uh, Kerala State requesting him and then it was declared as a protected monument and the government afterwards appointed a person uh, to be there. Could you explain the significance of radical caves in the historical studies and researches? One um, huge rock standing vertically uh, there and another rock, a rock uh, falling on it. This is the way it is made and uh, it looks like a cave, but it is not a cave. It is uh, two rocks, you know, one uh, slanting and falling down on the other. There is a narrow entrance and with this, uh, most probably it must have been uh, a prehistoric rock shelter because the tribal people could have found it a very uh, safe place, safe uh, from the attack of wild animals because the entrance was narrow. So, elephants and other wild animals could not enter there, only tigers could. And inside, once you enter there, uh, um, there is place for at least uh, 100 people to, there is a big hall. Yeah. Yeah. And what we call the uh, rock art there is not actually the rock art as you find in other places. Uh, rock paintings are there in Kerala also. They are uh, drawings made and paintings made with the vegetable colors and all that. But here in Edekel, there is nothing like that. It is only um, deep lines, geometrically uh, shaped, you know, and straight lines and some curved lines also, uh, they dig the rock. It must have been originally about uh, one or two inches deep, but now it is uh, at least one inch deep, you know. To cut that uh, in that way manner, they must have required um, uh, metallic tools. So, my inference is that the drawings that you find there, etchings uh, as you can call it, not, they are not drawings, you know. They are not color uh, drawings, but they are deep lines made, etchings made there. It, they must be, must be made, must have been made uh, by metal points. That is why I thought that this this is not of the old stone age or the new stone age, but the iron age, when they could use uh, iron implements in order to cut it deep that way. And uh, while there is a wealth of uh, rock art in India uh, with a beam bed car in Madhya Pradesh as the center uh, going far to the north uh, uh, to Rajasthan to Kalinga or Orissa uh, on the east and uh, to the west coast on the west southwards to Kanyakumari. Uh, this is different from that. Here you do not have drawings like that, you have only etchings. Uh, and they form uh, a unique kind of thing for which you have no parallel elsewhere in the world. 
In Maharashtra, there are some, but not as much as this. But apart from that, the ordinary rock art, there is a rock art society in India. Uh, they have identified many places, but they are all drawings and paintings on the rock. Here you do not have anything like that, but etchings only. There is a big difference. And um, there are some uh, inscriptions, uh, short low label inscriptions. You know. Palpuli Antagari is one part of it, a label inscription in Brahmi script. Like that, two or three others have been identified also. Uh, but they must have been done much later. The rock shelter could have been used as a shelter from sun and rain, from wild animals, from very early prehistoric times. But these, the Brahmi uh, writing and all that, uh, they could have been only in the early centuries of the Christian era, not, not earlier than that. So, you cannot combine the two. Yeah. The use of the place by uh, tribals, wild tribes, uh, for safety from wild animals must have been there for, for centuries together. And much later, only in the beginning of the Christian era, uh, people must have started writing there. Could you explain the ancient identity of Vayanad in the context of Edakal enclaves? <laughs> they form a class by themselves. The rest of Vayanad is different. But Vayanad Vainad is a, uh, probably the name was originally wild nard. Wild is a clearing in the forest. Uh, Vainad is um, a forest area with some clearings where people stayed. Uh, it must have been uh, used by tribe uh, tribes uh, much ahead of uh, the plains because cultivation in the plains must have started much later. Even before that. Uh, People who um, live down the um, uh, fruits, uh, plantains and things like that without cultivation or with uh, scanty cultivation, you know, on the surface must have been using these places. So, the rest of Vainad cannot be clubbed with Adagal. Adagal must have been there in a different way and uh, um, in the megalithic age, people must have started uh, cultivating in the clearings of uh, wild nard, oil nard which became wild nard. And um, since uh, it was geographically separated from the rest of Kerala, mm. the Aryan um, immigration, uh, Aryan uh, migrations and settlements did not take place there in wild nard as much as in the rest of Kerala. Did you find any similarities between the uh, enclaves of Yadakal and the other uh, cave in India? It is difficult uh, to make a decision because what they point out is that <coughs> some of the signs uh, in Yadakal resemble the signs of the Indus Valley script, you know. But actually, uh, by space, in space, uh, it is uh, hundreds and hundreds of miles away in this valley and radical. Uh, in time, in time, it is several centuries away. So, whatever similarity is there could have been accidental. We do not know whether the Indus uh, script signs are picto pictographs or alphabets. That is not certain even today. We are not succeeded, you know. In certain cases like hieroglyphics in Egypt, uh, they were able to decipher the Egyptian writing in the uh, pyramids because they were able to discover a stone. It is known as Rosetta stone. Rosetta is a small tributary of the Nile and on the banks of Rosetta this piece of stone was found. There is writing um, first <coughs> in the uh, pictorial writing, then in the Aramaic writing. Uh, the uh, the um, script you used in Jesus time and Greek, three writings are there you know. So, by comparing these three, the, com these three compartments after several years you know about 20 years of research they found that uh, one 
word is repeated six times. It is here, it is here, it is here also. So, they tried to identify where the um, repeated word is located within the text. They found that there was some similarity in the um, area. From the Greek writing, they could make out that this was the name of a king, Tutankhamen. Tutankhamen nalla perana. So, they tried to locate uh, this name in the other three, three two also. That is how these um, uh, uh, hieroglyphics were deciphered from the Rosetta stone. This is a picture of the Rosetta stone. Oh. It is now kept in the British Museum. How do you evaluate the engravings in the Edekal case? Well, these engravings are unique. You do not find a similar thing in the rock art in other parts of India or other parts of the world. Um, they are stylized pictures, not realistic. So, you see you have a figure, a central figure, which looks like the head of a human being uh, with geometrical uh, stylized shape with a huge headgear like uh, those of the Tayam now found in um, North Kerala. It is possible that there is some relationship between the Tayam and these figures because they look alike you know the headgear is the same way uh, elaborately done. Among the uh, northern Kerala tribals there is a myth of a, a remote ancestor called Vainat Kulavan. Vainat Kulavan is supposed to be the ancestor uh, of the people who came down from Vainat. So, uh, there could have been some connection between this and uh, uh, the later migrations. Mudian, there is the uh, myth of a Mudian bully which prevented the Paniyas. Paniyas, Mullakurbas, different groups were there. When Fawcett wanted uh, them to accompany him, they said, we won't come to uh, that particular hill because it is the area of Mudian Puli where we have a, an annual festival. Once in a year we go there and offer sacrifice, we won't come there. That is uh, what um, uh, made him um, uh, explore the area and write that article in the Indian Antiquary. In the later period, uh, immigrants from all sorts of areas when the, the tribals are mixed up with uh, other civilized uh, groups. Only thing is there are certain points like Trishileri, Tirunelli, where you have inscriptions of a later period oh. and Tirumarudur. Must be about uh, Tirumarudur la Kavya undala. Unni Achi. Unni Achi. Uh, 13th, 14th century period like it.